Hello, everyone. Before I start sharing my story with you today, I want you to take a couple seconds and think of what you wanted to be when you grow up, when you were a little child. How many of you are doing the same thing today? Well, I don't see a lot of hands, but we'll get back to that. Ever since I was a young child, I was fascinated with bridges. I was fascinated by the power they had in connecting once disconnected communities and areas of land. Fast forward into my early years of college, and there I was, planning a career for myself in civil engineering, where I could design and build those bridges that I always dreamed of. As part of my final year in my uh, civil engineering undergraduate studies, I had the chance to work with an underprivileged community in, a, uh, in an area neighboring a refugee camp in Beirut, the capital city of my home country, Lebanon. One of the very interesting things of the area we worked in was its location. At the borderline between two different municipalities, and those different municipalities had different agendas and different sets of priorities. The Saha area we worked in suffered from different challenges. One of those challenges was a deteriora deteriorating piping network as well as clogging in, in its drainage uh, facilities, as well as challenges in the transportation flows in the area that was highly dense and populated in that urban center. So for the following few months, after first visiting the site and learning more about its challenges, we worked on designing and proposing different designs for rehabilitating this piping network, for uh, addressing the challenges of the clogging in the area, as well as redesigning and proposing new designs for circulation flows uh, for improving the traffic situation of the area. And after that, we had the chance to meet with the community so we can share with them our proposed design and get our feedback. And to our surprise, most of what we proposed after three, four months of work got rejected. How could that be? We worked on these designs for several months. We worked according to the codes that we learned. We double-checked our calculations, and we made sure that everything made sense. So how could it be that most of what we proposed did not go through? Well, it happens that one of the things we were proposing was to change the functionality of one of the main roads in that area, because it simply made more engineering sense for us. It made it easier for us to rehabilitate one of the main pipelines in the area. And that was not popular among different city residents, because they wanted the road to stay the same. And we were further also, uh, we had the challenge of convincing both municipalities with the same options, because they had to be partners in those solutions, and there was a challenge also in bringing both, uh, both people to the table who are decision makers on both sides of, of the municipalities. So as I was ready to finish with my civil engineering degree at the time, I, this, this project made me learn three important lessons. The first lesson was that engineering know-how alone was not sufficient to address these challenges. We needed to look at the political, social, economic challenges that also came with the engineering challenge that we had in hand in order for us to propose solutions that made sense and were implementable. The second lesson was the importance of the early on involvement of the community in the decision-making process and in the co-creation of the solutions rather than being the engineers who are the problem solvers who know better and impose solutions on the community. And the third was the importance of not only creating that scientific and engineering knowledge, but spending a lot of time on communicating that knowledge to, to support the decision-making process and to support those who are making those decisions on both sides of the spectrum. Moving forward, and as I started my graduate work at Purdue University, I started looking at three grand challenges that are facing our global community today. Water security, energy security, and food security. Do you know that by 2050, we are projected to need 55% more water, 60% more food, and 80% more energy? And the challenge is not only limited with our ability to bridge these demands independently, because for a simple fact, 
that there is a growing interdependence between those challenges. So we need a lot of water for our agricultural sector to grow our agricultural product, as well as a lot of water that goes into uh, energy development and energy production. And similarly, there's a lot of energy that is needed to pumping, uh, transporting, desalinating, and treating our water, as well as a lot of energy that goes throughout the agricultural supply chain from farm to table. So unless we understand how these challenges are interconnected and interdependent, we will fail to address them as we move forward. And there's a critical need also for moving that understanding into the policymaking community. So we are able to also propose and implement policies that are coherent and are consistent with our understanding of those interconnections. Take the case of San Antonio, for example. All of these dots you see on the map are water wells. The blue dots are water wells for municipal use. Green dots are water wells for irrigation and food production. And the red dots are water wells for energy production. And we can clearly and quickly start seeing the extent of competition that exists between these three growing sectors in the area of San Antonio where these three sectors, these three growing sectors, compete over the same water, land, and financial resources in the region. And in a study we, we've been working on uh, with the Water Energy Food Nexus Initiative at Texas A&M, we've learned that low level of communication exists between different agencies and organizations that help govern and plan for these resource systems, even though we can clearly see the tight interconnections and uh, competition that exists between them. And this kind of hotspot is not only limited to Texas. It emerges and appears in different places all over the world. And it appears in different shapes and levels of urgency in different regions. And at the Water Energy Food Nexus Research Group here on campus, we've been exploring a lot of these case studies all over the world. And even though a lot of our understanding of the holistic systems of systems thinking that, that guide our understanding of the interconnections between these three challenges, the interventions and the solutions for addressing them are very much site-specific and context-specific. So don't you wish we had a plan, a global plan to address all of these global challenges that we've been talking about? Well, if your answer is yes, I have some good news for you because we actually do. And in fact, in 2015, 193 heads of states that are member nations to the United Nations met and agreed to work towards 17 sustainable development goals. These sustainable development goals include ones that are specific to water, energy, and food security, but also extend much more beyond that to those that are uh, addressing alleviating poverty, hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, climate change, and building global partnerships, among others. Having a plan is good, but is only as good as the effort we put into it. And then unless we all get on board and find our role in contributing to this agenda and these goals, we will not be able to arrive to the 2030 that we're planning for. And this set of goals comes, it's not the first time we do this exercise. And this set of goals, in fact, comes after another set of goals which we adopted in year 2000 and we worked towards in the last 15 year uh, period. Those goals addressed different challenges that focused on uh, challenges that were facing developing countries. And we have done a lot of progress. Were those goals successful? Were they useful? Absolutely, yes. Were we able to achieve all of those goals that we aimed for in the 15-year period? Absolutely not. But we've done a lot of progress. And what we need to do now is to amplify that momentum in order for us to, to, to carry us forward into achieving the new set of goals and the, the new sustainability goals that we set for ourselves uh, for 2030. So to just give you an idea of the kind of progress that such kind of goals was, was, uh, was able to uh, help us achieve. So in the past 15 year term, Having those Millennium Development Goals have focused our effort globally to cut extreme poverty by half. Reality is, we still have one out of five, seven people that will go hungry tonight and is living still on less than $1.25 uh, per day.
Let that sink in for a second. In the last 15 years, we were able to improve primary education enrollment from 83% to 91%, which is a great achievement. Yet, one out of 10 children are still not in school today. According to the Millennium Development Goal indicators, we were able to meet uh, uh, gender equality indicators uh, in the primary school level, yet the reality is women still hold less secure jobs than men, and we still have a long way to go in terms of gender equality. Child mortality was cut by more than half, which is also another great achievement, yet six million children still die before their fifth birthday today. And last but not least, in the past 15 years, we were able to improve the sanitation of one-fourth of the world. Yet, the reality is, one in three people still do not have access to proper sanitation. So you could think of this as a marathon, and we are halfway. So does it make sense for us to just stop halfway? I don't think so. So what we need to do is to find our role in, in this global agenda and be able to with, with our different disciplines, with the different countries that we come from, with the different age groups we come from, different generations and different interests, to be able to find our role so, so we could collectively be able to, to work towards uh, addressing these challenges. And one particular thing I'd like to bring your attention to also is that what we need to do uh, in, in, in order for us to arrive to these 2030 goals is also be innovative and creative in the way we look at, in, uh, at, at proposing different solutions and at looking at the interconnections between those challenges as well. Because business as usual models will fail to help us arrive to, to those goals that we have. So going back to the water, energy, and food sustainable development goals that I, I'm, I'm working on. Uh, we are making a lot of progress, yet, Reality is, in 2017, 844 million still lack access to safe drinking water. And a lot of water stress indicators are most severe in areas that are least able to respond to those challenges and are hubs uh, for major population density uh, uh, globally. 1.1 billion still lack access to energy, 50% of which are in the African continent. And 815 million still do not have access to secure food. And also climate change uh, uh, vulnerability indicators will all only exacerbate those challenges, again, in areas that are least capable of responding to those challenges. So all of these challenges that we're talking about are very complex and very interconnected. And no one discipline will be able to address them and find solutions for them. So there is a very n important need for us to build bridges across different disciplines and be able to, uh, to work collectively towards addressing these challenges in order for us to arrive to the 2030 that we're aiming for. There's also an important need for us to bridge and make bridges between uh, a scientific know-how and the policy-making community. So we are able also to develop uh, solutions and policies that are coherent and consistent with our scientific understanding so we are able to address those, uh, those complex challenges. A little more than a decade ago, I was planning a career in building and designing bridges. Little did I know my journey would bring me here today to give a talk still about building bridges, but a different kind of bridges. Bridges that are needed between different disciplines and bridges that are needed between science and policy. Unless we work more on building those bridges and investing our time and effort in working across disciplines and working across communicating the scientific know-how into the policy-making community, we will have additional challenges into arriving to uh, the future that, that we're looking for. And here I'd like to take this opportunity to talk to people of my generation, the generation of future leaders, generation of future scientists, future economists, future politicians, and future engineers. We do not only have the power, but the responsibility of 
bridging those challenges and understanding those challenges. And we have the responsibility of reversing the unsustainable trends that, that we face today. And in order for us to arrive to that, we might need a fresh look at the way our societies function and the value systems of our societies in order to arrive to those challenges. We need to also be doing that while keeping an open mind and looking beyond the traditional definitions of our disciplines and, the and not be confined within those definitions and make sure that we are reaching out into other disciplines so we are able to address these challenges. And while we're all collectively working towards these goals, we need to also make sure that we keep our journeys unique and personal. So my personal journey has made me arrive today to want to contribute through better understanding and quantifying the interconnections between water energy and food security and translating that knowledge and spending the effort on communicating that knowledge of interconnections and trade-offs with policy makers in order to arrive to policies that are coherent and consistent with that understanding. How will you choose to contribute? And I say choose because you have the power of choice of either doing nothing, accepting the status quo, or having a high level of meliorism and being part of a 2030, be part of the marathon and be part of that finish line that is more sustainable, equitable, and inclusive for all. Thank you very much.